Hello, and welcome to the Chapter 3 Video Reading Guide for the OpenStax textbook for Physics 131. This chapter, which begins on page 87 of the PDF of the textbook, covers two-dimensional kinematics. In particular, we will be spending quite a bit of time in this chapter talking about vectors. The idea of a vector was introduced in Chapter 2, but we'll really be getting into a lot of mechanics of how to use and manipulate vectors in this particular chapter. So, moving on, we're going to get started with Section 3.1, which is introducing the idea of kinematics in two dimensions. Now, as was discussed in the Chapter 2 reading, kinematics is the study of motion. We're not to why things move yet, we're just trying to describe the motion of objects mathematically. So here you have a nice example of someone walking in a nice city of grid streets. And how to use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the total distance traveled by a person. You'll be using a lot of the Pythagorean theorem in our study of two-dimensional kinematics and throughout this course. So if you are by chance unfamiliar or not comfortable or it's been just a really long time about with regards to the Pythagorean theorem, please come and see me as soon as possible so we can get you up to speed. Now, at the bottom of page 89, you have a little bit of comment about the independence of perpendicular motions. While this is just a small subsection of 3.1, I really want to put a star by this, because this is really a fundamental idea that probably deserves a little bit more credit than this. And essentially, the idea is that the vertical and two and horizontal components of motion are independent of each other, which means a velocity, which you'll recall from chapter two is a vector quantity horizontally, in, which we might call the x direction, does not change at all our motion up and down, what we might call the y direction. So a velocity in x, no change to y. So this is a really, really important idea that I really think you should take a little bit of time to think about, and there are some questions on in your homework. Here's a nice graphic representing that idea. This is a really good graphic to think about and really make sure you understand. You can see in this graphic that for an object that's falling, which is what you're looking at here, the velocity in the vertical directions changes. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the object falls faster, faster, and faster. Of course, this is what we would expect. For an object thrown, however, we have something kind of interesting. The vertical components get bigger and bigger and bigger, just like for the object that was just dropped, but its horizontal motion, its speed side to side, is unchanged. So this is a really nice example of how up and down and side to side are completely independent of each other. Now we're going to move into page 91 on vector addition and subtraction, thinking about how to do it graphically. So sections 3.2 and 3.3 are, like I said, really getting into the mechanics of how to use and manipulate these ideas of vectors. These are tools that we're going to be using throughout the course because many of the quantities we're going to study, such as force and momentum, are all going to be vectors. So in order to study these ideas, we need to understand vectors. So 
The first thing that you might think of what can you do with a vector is adding and subtracting. Now, again, going back to the idea of physics as ideas that can be represented multiple ways, we can represent and think about vector addition two ways, graphically and algebraically. This chapter deals with graphically. And in particular, it thinks about vectors in only two dimensions. So side to side and up and down, no front back. So the three dimensions in our world are, so we have three dimensions in our world. A dimension is a direction in which you can move. So you've got say forward, back, then you have up, down, left, right. Those are our three dimensions. It turns out that most things only happen in two at a time. So we're really going to be interested in vectors that have only two dimensions. We're going to be thinking in two dimensions for the most part. So things that are moving, say, forward and back and up and down, or up and down and left and right, or forward and back and left and right. You know, we very rarely will do all three possible motions at the same time. So we're going to start with vectors in two dimensions. There's some nice notation here about how they represent vectors, so that's probably worth paying attention to. Then you really get into the nitty gritty of how to add vectors using what's known as the head to tail method. So I would recommend you really pay attention to this method, really understand it. There's some problems in your homework to help you practice with this. So make sure you give this one a shot. If you have any questions, as always, Come to an office hour. We'll be happy to help you out. You can see that this is a very step-by-step -step algorithmic procedure. So it, it's just learn the steps and really go through them. It's just like, say, long division. There's a series of steps you do, and you just repeat that process over and over for any long division problem. It's the same thing with vector addition. You just learn the series of steps and you can do it for any two vectors. So, so you have some more examples, which are all beneficial. Then they get into the idea of vector subtraction, which is going to be important because you've seen that, for example, acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time, and this thing's a vector. So you're looking at a vector subtraction in the definition of velocity. So we need to make sure we understand vector subtraction. So that's what begins here on the bottom of page 95. The basic idea is encapsulated in this picture, that when you add a negative sign to a vector, you flip the direction. So the vector is going B goes this way, negative B goes this way, and then you can think of subtraction just as adding negative numbers, just like you can for numbers. You can do it with vectors too. So here's vector subtraction graphically with a few nice examples for you to think about. The next thing with vectors to think about is multiplying vectors by scalars. If you've ever taken any physics class ever, you will probably remember seeing force is equal to mass times acceleration. Force and acceleration are vectors, but mass is a scalar. If you think back to chapter two, a scalar was defined as a number without a direction. Masses don't really point anywhere, they just are, so mass is a scalar. So the ability to multiply a vector by a scalar is clearly going to be important as that operation is in the one of the fundamental equations we're going to be using 
for this class. So learn how to do that. Before you get into thinking about how to add vectors algebraically or, or with something that you might more recognize as math, you have to know how to separate a vector into components or parts. This is nicely done with a picture. If you have a vector like this, it has a part that goes horizontal and it has a part that goes vertical. So these parts are the components. And you need to be able to learn how to do this before being able to do um, vector addition with something that looks maybe more like math you're used to seeing. And this process really comes down to trigonometry, sines, cosines, tangents. If you look on the math we expect you to know page, we're expecting you to know the definition of sine, cosine, and tangent. We're not expecting you to know any weird trig identities like sine squared of theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. We're not expecting you to know any of those, but we're expecting you to know what sine, cosine, and tangent are in terms of the sides of a triangle. Again, if you're uncomfortable with this, please come and see myself or one of the TAs as soon as possible, and we can work out some, some review to get you up to speed. So now that you've talked about the idea of splitting into components and you know trigonometry is coming, here is a step-by-step -step procedure on how to do that. You can see that you start to get some triangles going on. You're always trying to make nice right triangles to solve for components. And here's the trigonometry that I promised. So now... Moving on a little bit more. On page 101, you get to, all right, actually doing the math of how to add vectors with components. So how do you actually do it? We saw how to do it with pictures. Now you gotta be able to do it if I give you a vector is say five meters in X and three meters in Y and another vector is 3 meters in x and 5 meters in y, how do you add them? How do you actually go about adding them? That's what's being discussed in this particular section. So this shows you, again, it's a step-by-step -step procedure, like, say, long division or subtracting big numbers. You know, there's a step-by-step -step procedure. Same is true here. There's a step-by-step -step procedure that we just kind of expect you to learn and know. We'll get practice with it in class. I'd like to remind you something from the goals and objectives worksheet for this chapter. Our goal here is for you to learn the mechanics of how to do vector addition. So if I give you two vector vectors drawn as pictures, I want you to be able to draw the sum or the difference. If I give you two vectors, say AX is three meters and A y is 5 meters and bx is 2 meters and by is minus 1 meter. I should be able to give you this, ask you a plus b, and you should be able to give me an answer. That's what we're expecting you to do. We're not really expecting you to take big convoluted word problems and set these up. We'll work on that in class. We just want you to know the mechanics, how to turn the crank. We'll deal with the problem solving aspect of using these things in class. So you have some nice examples to study and practice with before you try practicing it on your own in the homework. And this is where I want you to stop. So I want you to read before this, but do not read section 3.4 or any subsequent sections in this particular chapter. We're going to approach projectile motion in a slightly different way, using some different tools, some more modern and sophisticated tools that you'll be able to use elsewhere in your careers.
the way this book covers it is really nice for people who want to become physicists or engineers or stuff like that. But for most of you, these particular equations not very helpful. So we're going to approach things in a slightly more modern way and use simulation to understand these phenomena as opposed to some basic equations. So that ends our video guide for chapter three. Enjoy your reading.